Associate Professor Dr. Prakashit Sitthitikun, Thammasat University, Thailand. Associate Professor Dr. Atipat Unmo, King Mongut University of Technology, Thonburi. Assistant Professor Dr. Atisak Suking, Maha Sarakam University, Thailand. Assistant Professor Dr. Gonripa Punpun, Gonripa Punpun, Kongen University. And Dr. Eric Ambell from Maha Sarakam University, Thailand. These invited speakers will be on site, and we have a lot of invited speakers online as well. Professor Nimi Lai. Ministry of Education, Myanmar. Assistant Professor Dr. Moshe Salim Aljaro from Seyun University, Yemen. Assistant Professor Dr. Mut Mena, Universitas Al Asharia, Manda Sulawesi, Bharat, Indonesia. Associate Professor Dr. Agus Dama Yoga Patama, Universitas Wamadewa, Indonesia. Professor Dr. Erum Kambir Singh from Manipur University, okay. India. <laughs> Professor Dr. Kamilas from <laughs> College, Philippines. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third international conference on English language teaching icon. ELT 2024, taking place on this beautiful 16th of March, whether you are here with us at the venue or connected from afar. Your presence today is what makes this conference truly special. Over the next two days, from 16th and 17th of March, we will dive into the evil world of ELT, exploring innovative practices, research, and insight that define our field. And I am Piyash Hathe Pasadena UTR, a PhD student in English language teaching program at Buri Ramesh Pat University. And I have the distinct honor to welcome the president of Buri Ramesh Pat University for presiding over the opening ceremony on Lai, who has been a pillar of support and inspiring for English language teaching program. We also have the privilege to have a lot of distinguished guests and from various countries who have gradually accepted our invitation to share their expertise, their global perspective will undoubtedly enrich our discussion and learning. As we embark on these two days of learning, networking and collaboration, let's keep an open mind, engage actively and make the most of this opportunity to contribute to and benefits from the wealth of knowledge within our international conference community. So with no further ado, let's begin our journey at ICON ELT 2024. So may I lead you to the opening ceremony of the International Conference, the third International Conference on ELT, English Language Teaching ICON ELT 2024. On this occasion, may I invite Associate Professor Dr. Akarapon Nermaihom, the Dean of Faculty of Humanity and Social Science and PhD ELT Program Chair to deliver a report speech. And may I invite Associate Professor Dr. Malini to Topama, the President of the Burirama Shepard University to listen to the report speech and give an opening speech, please. Associate Professor Malini Jutopama, the President of Buri Ram Rajapat University, on behalf of the Conference Organizing Committee, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude and to express my sincere thanks to Madam President for presiding over ICON ELT 2024, the third international conference on English language. Your opening remarks are also greatly appreciated. The Doctor of Philosophy in English Language Teaching, ELT, which is under the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, and also the Graduate School, Buri Ram Ratapat University, Thailand, offers the curriculum that prepares students 
for advanced professional careers in English teaching. Its objective is to produce and cultivate personnel who are proficient in ELT, possess sound ethical and moral principles, and also are endowed with the capacity to teach English at both national and international levels. To achieve these objectives, the third International Conference on English Language Teaching, or ICONT ELT 2024, is being organized under the theme, Current Trends in Task-Based Language Teaching, Implication for the ELT Research. The main reasons to hold the third ELT Symposium is to establish a network of academic collaboration in this field. Furthermore, ICON ELT 2024 serves as a forum for interchange of insight and expertise, fostering a network of academic collaboration in ELT among scholars and researchers from both within and beyond Thailand. Besides the PhD program of BRU, as the conference main host, the six national and international academic partners of BRU have also been officially invited to co-host this symposium as the following. Seiyun University, Jemen. Laudas College Graduate Studies, the Philippines. Universitas al Asayaria, Mande, Indonesia. University of Foreign Language and International Studies, Wei University, Vietnam. Phi University of Varamadewa, Indonesia and the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Mahasarakam University, Thailand. At this academic event, it is an honor to have the distinguished keynote speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, who is going to deliver a keynote address on the trendy topic, Current Trends in Task-Based Language Teaching implication for ELT research. Moreover, we also have with us the well-known feature speakers on site as follows. Associate Professor Dr. Prakasit Sitidagun from Thammasat University. Associate Professor Dr. Atipat Bunma from King Mongkut University of Technology, Thonburi. Assistant Professor Dr. Apisak Suking from Mahasarakam University. Assistant Professor Dr. Gonvipa Poonpon from Konkan University, and Dr. Eric Ambere from Mahasarakam University. In addition, the renowned scholars as our invited speakers are also taking part in the icons online as the following. Professor Dr. Nini Lai from Myanmar, Professor Dr. Imram Gambi Singh from Manipur University, India, Professor Dr. Kurt Candilas from Laudas College, the Philippines. Assistant Professor Dr. Moshet Aujaro from Seiyun University, Yemen. Assistant Professor Dr. Mut Maina from Universitas Al Asyaria, Manda, Indonesia. Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Absal from Shanghai International Studies, University of China. And Associate Professor Dr. August Dharma Yoga Pratama from Universitas Waramadewa, Indonesia. There are 30 international manuscripts from different countries such as Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, China, Yemen, Indonesia, and the Philippines. In addition, approximately uh, 100 participants from Thailand and abroad are energetically participating in this third icon, ELT, Symposium, both online on site. At this auspicious moment, I would like to humbly invite Associate Professor Malini Yutopama, the President of Buriram Rajapat University, to deliver an opening remarks and also proclaim the ICON ELT 2024 officially open. Please. Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton from Victoria University of Wellington. Professor Nini Rai, featured speakers, scholars, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 
It is my immense pleasure to have been invited by the organizing committee of this conference to preside over the English Symposium and deliver the inaugural address today. As the president of Budilam Rajapat University, I'm very pleased to warmly welcome both Thai and college cohorts, researchers, and scholars to the ICON ELT 2024. As the president of Budilam Rajapat University, I'm very delighted to extend a cordial welcome to Thai and international cohorts, researchers, and academics attending ICON ELT 2023. It's my personal appreciation to realize that this international conference on ELT is being organized for the third time by the PhD program in ELT under the Faculty of Humanities and Social Science, BRU. In addition, six other recipients in students from various nations have been invited to co-host this academic event. I'm certain that this conference will contribute to the application of academic and research work on contents in task-based language teachings. In addition, this symposium will promote and strengthen academic collaborations between BRU and academic partners from around the world. On behalf of Budilam Rajapat University, I extend a warm welcome to co-hosts, experts, researchers, academicians, lecturers, graduate students, and participants. Last but not least, I would like to thank the keynote speaker, Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton, as well as the Peter speakers, commentators, scholars, others, and participants from various universities in Thailand and abroad for their academic support and contributions. I wish everyone at this international conference success and academic benefits. At this momentous occasion, I would like to declare the icon ELT 2024 of Bushuri open. Thank you very much. Sawadika. Ramachpat University, Associate Professor Malini Jatopama for those inspiring words. And it's now my privilege to invite Dr. Professor, Assist, Assistant Professor Dr. Nawamin Prashanan, the Vice President of Riram Rajpat University, and the Committee of ELT Program to deliver his thankful speech. <laughs> Madam Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great privilege to express my thankful message for all relevant people who makes this conference happen. First and foremost, uh, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to Associate Professor Malini Jutopama, the president of Buram Rajapat University for your huge support and cont contribution. Without her, okay, this conference could not be possible. The second one, I would like to uh, thank Associate Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, okay, to be accepted to be the keynote speaker in this conference. The fourth one, the third one, I would like to Thanks, okay, all featured speakers who are accepted to, okay, give a lecture or give more knowledge to all participants. The fourth one, I would like to thanks all co-hosts, 
okay, of Icon ELT for the third time, okay, from both overseas and Thailand. And next, okay, thankful goes to all peer reviewers and commentators who are, okay, from overseas and Thailand. And next, okay, I would like to thank, okay, all speakers and listeners who attend this conference. Last but not least, I would like to thank all the committee, the organizing committee, okay, led by uh, the chair of the program, Associate Professor Dr. Akarpon Nguyen Mai Hom, okay, and uh, his students, okay, to make this conference happen. Okay, and then I do hope that the first international conference on English language teaching, okay, will achieve the goal set out. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Vice President. And now it is a time to witness a special cultural performance to welcome the guests at this special conference. Ladies and gentlemen, the performance is called Nata Lila Apsara Wanam Rung. And the performers are students in Thai Dramatic Arts, Faculty of Education of Puram Rajapat University. There are Natakan, there are a lot of students. Natakan, Yet Siri, Daniel, Gert, Thai Boon, Mukda, Dong In, Ganika, Pon San, Pon Tita, Ab Tong. So the students are ready to perform for all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the performance Natalila Apsara Wanamrum.
performance from Thai Dramatic Arts Faculty of Education. On this occasion, uh, may I invite Assistant Professor Dr. Nawamin Prashanan, the Vice President, on the front of the stage. For all the performers, นักศึกษาที่เป็นนักแสดงนะคะนักแสดงคะเดี๋ยวขออนุญาตที่บนเวทีเรียงกันนิดนึงนะคะเดี๋ยวเราจะมีพิธีมอบของที่ระลึกนะคะแล้วก็รวมถึงถ่ายรูปร่วมกันด้วยค่ะค่ะ So may I invite Associate Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton on the stage. We are going to have the session of presentation of um, token of appreciation for your visit at our university, please. ขอบคุณนักศึกษานะคะเดี๋ยวยืนบนเวทีก่อนนะคะแล้วเดี๋ยวถ่ายรูปร่วมกันค่ะ So on this occasion, it's a presentation of token of appreciation for Associate Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton. Thank you very much for being with us and deliver a fruitful session since yesterday and two more days in the conference. And at this auspicious moment, may I invite organizing committee, all the invited speakers on the stage to take a group photo together with the performers and all the distinctive guests, please. In turn, Kai. May I invite all the invited speakers on the stage and the curriculum committee and the distinguished guests to take a photo together. This is a really special event, and I heard that this is the first time that we have cultural performance at a conference. Well, so thank you very much. Thank you to performance, and can thank you all the distinguished guests. Now, let's get to know the university a little bit more, and also the program of PhD ELT, and we have. Video presentation for you, and you can get to know more about BRU, Buramrashpat University, and Faculty of Humanity and Social Science, and PhD ELT program more from the video presentation. So let's enjoy it. President of Bulangara Chapatu University. Very pleased to warmly welcome all candidates from both Thailand and overseas to pursue a PhD in ELT at Bulangara Chapatu University, Thailand. At BAU, I grant guarantee you that your ultimate goal of being a teaching master of advanced English language can be fulfilled. I highly hope to have you as the energetic PhD student majoring in ELT at our university soon. Thank you so much. Sawadee You all are cordially invited to be a member of our family, a PhD program in English Language Teaching or ELT under the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. Buriram Rajapat University, Thailand. 
I strongly believe that the ELT curriculum under the PhD program offers me a lot of effective methodologies and innovation in teaching the advanced English language. On of the Thai professor teaching at BRU are so knowledgeable and competent that students can gain knowledge in their fields which make it possible to guide them through understanding the research process. Moreover, professors continue to support and encourage students to show their potential to the fullest extent by giving perfect pitch of advice. The PhD program in English language teaching at BRU provides me with rigorous courses and trainings by plenty of well-known visiting professors from top institutes around the world. They give me multiple global perspectives on English language teaching. We have an opportunity to learn with many well-known scholars in ELT fields from all around the world, such as Professor Dr. Paul K. Masuda from Arizona State University, USA, Dr. Willy Rananya from the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and Professor Dr. Pusaba Kanok Silapathak from Silapakon University, Thailand. Many more professors will be officially invited to deliver special talks on different trendy topics relevant to ELT both online and on-site at BRU campus. It's true that Pressure is a lovely relation and good relationship where support is, no matter what the circumstances. The relationship of Thai and Myanmar students is unique. We care for one another. We share positive views and feelings. We learn together happily and collaborate, help mutually. Graduate school, Buriram Rajapat University, set up smart classroom with full equipment. Students can study in a very well prepared and academic environment. Besides ELT program, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences prepares the Hinstock Learning Resources Center where students can study, work, or have a meeting for their group discussion. I certainly guarantee you that the PhD student in ELT at Buria Rajabe University will be provided with the best facility and service. This is the right university and it's your good chance to make the right decision to pursue a PhD degree in ELT within a time frame of three years. Warmly welcome all of you to study a PhD in ELT provided by Faculty of Humanity and Social Sciences, Kuriya Rajabe University. Academic conferences are a crucial part of the PhD student. The conference also brings you together with experts and researchers who have similar aspirations. The success of the first international conference on English language teaching 2022 icon leads the ELT program to have the second icon 2023. These precious opportunities offer a well-structured mix of activities, including panel sections, keynote speakers, oral and poster presentations, exhibits, workshops, and interactive Q&A sections. This undoubtedly builds your confidence as a researcher and PhD students in ELT at BRU. The PhD in English language teaching at BRU is inviting well-known experts in the field of ELT. The program allows students to experience different and innovative teaching methods. We also have the opportunity to work together and share experience with the researchers who have an international distinguished research records. In this regard, we will grow with highly specialized knowledge and 
specific properties to display in our doctrinal basic defense. From perspectives of ELT pedagogy, policy, and practice, we have focused on theory and research in English language education. Second, we have explored new trends in English teaching methods, innovative teaching materials, and assessments, all of which can be applied to our ELT classrooms. In addition, professor educates us the new trends of research case studies, research tools, and the emerging modern trend in ELT. This will link to the future trend in applied linguistics and the major direction in global ERT fields. Welcome to BRU Accommodation and Hotel. BRU Dormitory is provided for students, lecturers, and personnel, including BRU International Hostel for Foreign Exchange Students. Besides, Panubiman Hotel located on the BRU campus is also facilitated and served to personal and the community. I am sure that our hotel must be the best choice for all gates who plan to visit the historical and sport city in Buriram province. The city of sandstone centuries, the land of volcanoes and beautiful silk and rich culture. Hello everyone, today I would like to explain to everyone how good the workshop of PhD student at Buriram Rajapat University is. In organizing the workshop, we've been honored by well-known professor both overseas and domestically on diverse and comprehensive topic. For example, the professor Dr. Paul K. Masada from Arizona University, USA, who is a master in writing. Associate Professor Dr. Justin Bukio from Valley Dickinson University, USA, who is a master in journal publication. Associate Professor Dr. Prakrasit Sitthitikun from Thammasat University, who is a master in research. And Assistant Professor Dr. Ponpimon Sukhawati from Jhulalongkorn University, who is a master in English language teaching. Everyone is welcome to join integrated workshop both online and on-site in a hybrid form. So, I highly hope you will join us and become a part of our program soon. See you! And now I think it's time for us to move on to the next program of our conference. And the next part of the conference, you will, be, you will have a chance to listen to our keynote speakers. The keynote address on current trends in task based language teaching implications for ELT research by Associate Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. And in the next hour, you will gain more insights from him. Yesterday, we have already had one workshop about publication and about academic writing. So we asked PhD student. It is a great opportunity for me and also other uni other PhD students and the participant today to learn more from him again in the evening. And before we start, may I invite, may I introduce our professor so that you know more a little bit about our professor today. Associate Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton has worked in language teaching and language teacher education for more than 30 years in both New Zealand and China, where he began his teaching career. From 2002 to 2016, he was program director of the Bachelor of Education TESOL training program at Victoria University of Wellington, a role that involved working closely with Malaysian student teachers and Malaysian teacher training institutions. He is currently program director for the MA program in TESOL, Applied Linguistics and Second Language Learning and Teaching. Professor Jonathan is book review editor for the journal Language Teaching for Young Learners. He is particularly interested in review of 
classroom language learning textbooks as well as of academic books. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Associate Professor Dr. Jonathan Newton, please. Are we the cap? Good morning. Good, good to see you all here. Ah, how much time have I got? Four hours. I could talk all. I could talk all day. Um, we'll just wait for this to come. Okay. okay. All right. Good to see you all here. Um, Bodhipan Rajapat University. Thank you very much for the warm welcome, for the invitation, for the opportunity to come and visit your university. Ajahn Mark, Ajahn Ek. Where is Ajahn Ek? It's gone. Ah, ah. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful, uh, it's a wonderful privilege uh, to be here and to talk to you today. My name is Jonathan Newton. I come from New Zealand. Um, I come from this university, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Um, anybody been to New Zealand? Yeah, okay, two. Put it on your bucket list. Make sure you come to New Zealand. Um, this is my city, just to get a sense of where I come from. Uh, it's a small city, about half a million people nestled in the hills. So it's up and down. It's a harbor city. It's uh, pretty windy. So they have, to, they have to wait for the one day in a year when there's no wind, and they take a photo like this. Wellington is famous for the, uh, being the place where the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings were produced. So Peter Jackson, the director, lives in Wellington or just outside of Wellington. So I come from the School of Linguistics and Applied Language Studies, which is has a QS ranking uh, in 2023 of uh, the 55th, 55th ranked uh, linguistics, applied linguistics department in the world and the first in New Zealand. So we're quite an, you know, a well-established department. Uh, we've been in operation since about 1964. Uh, so there's a long heritage of work in applied linguistics, uh, particularly in this part of the world. Uh, you've got to just, yeah, 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 yeah. You've got to get off the Zoom because otherwise I can't use the clicker. Just no, no, no. Just just press Escape. There. Okay. No, no, no. no. Uh, okay, we're there. Okay, good. And just before I talk, give my talk. I'd just like to um, promote an opportunity that we offer in Singapore for our master's program. Now, I know you will all be PhD and master's graduates, but if you have colleagues, teachers in schools, or even in universities, who have got a bachelor's degree and are interested in doing a master's, the, the Regional English Language Center in, in um, Singapore offers full scholarships for students to publish, to, to, to publish, <laughs> to enroll in our master's program in TESOL. They pay a full scholarship. You spend eight months in Singapore. They pay for your accommodation. They give you a per diem. They look after the program. Now, there are something like 10 scholarships each year that are offered around CMEO countries. And at the moment, we've got two Thai teachers in the program who are wonderful. So... Uh, keep an eye out for that and, and spread the word with your friends or teachers you know who want to grow their career. Okay. Who knows who this is? Yeah? The young people know. 
Billie Eilish, right? Um, what do you, I mean, I've shown some of you this picture before, but what do you see in the picture? You see the audience with cameras. Do you think the audience are enjoying Billie Eilish? Maybe. But if they're watching their film and filming, it's like there's a barrier between the audience and the, and the performance. And so that's just simply a, an encouragement for you. You will only be here once with me. You might never see me again. <laughs> you know? So just, ima just imagine you'll never see me again, which you, you will be very grateful for. But in the meantime, if you're here, I'm just asking you to be here. Be, be with me. Look at me. Nod your head. Shake your head. Show that you're present for one hour uh, in the time that we've got together. All right, this is my talk. TBLT, Current Trends and Implications for ELT Research. Now, I just want to get a sense of how many of you have heard me talk before? Could you put your hand up if you've heard me talk before? Yes, come on, hi, hi hands. Not, not, not Asian hands, hi hands. Thank you. Right, okay, yeah. Well, you guys can go to sleep. <laughs> no. Um, so I'm going to just quickly cover the first basics. Uh, what is a task? Why tasks? For those of you who may not be so familiar, but I'm, I'm going to assume that most of you, you know, have the foundations of TBLT. And then I'm going to look at some current trends very selectively and, and research implications, and then open up the floor for questions. Okay. So think of your really hard questions and get ready to ask them. Just a bit of background to TBLT to give you an indication of how active this is as a field. First of all, we have an International Association of Task-Based Language Teaching. You can see the conference here from, uh, this is from, hmm, where was that, Innsbruck? Or before Innsbruck, I can't remember. But also, last year, CONCAN was the host of the International Association of TBLT Conference. Fantastic conference. That's the only, I'm sorry, um, Professor Boone, that's the only picture that I had in my files, but it gives you a sense of, uh, you know, really Thailand was on the stage for the first time in TBLT, which was, a, you know, a fantastic achievement, um, you know, to really build the profile of task-based language teaching in the region. The other thing to note is that task-based language teaching has its own journal. But actually, you can find task-based research in every journal. But there is now a specialized journal. And the other thing I would point out, there's also something called the Task Bank, which is a fantastic resource that if any of you are interested in TBLT, you really need to explore the task bank. I'm hosted by Indiana University. It, it's a place where teachers submit the tasks or task-based lessons that they have designed. And so there's a large bank of free resources there for you to go to. So my point TBLT is a really active area of research and pedagogy. Um, it's a very large community. It's a very dynamic community. It's an international community. There are people passionate about tasks all around the world. Okay, well, that's a bit of background. I suppose before I say, hey, you, I've been thinking about task-based language teaching since 1990, oh my God, 1980, something or other when I began teaching in China. And I was teaching in China, I was teaching speaking classes, and I knew that something was happening in the classes when I did activities, but I didn't know what it was, and I didn't understand the theory. And, and task-based language teaching gave me a frame, gave me a lens to understand the classroom better. Anyway, hey you, why are you here? Why are you here?
Huh? To learn something, to uh, meet up with your friends, to have a good time, watch the dances. What do you want to get from this session? If if you had to, if if you had to pay me, only if I delivered what you wanted. What would you tell me you wanted? <laughs> Complicated question. What do you want? You're giving me one hour, maybe more than one hour, of your life. <laughs> what am I going to give you back? Think about that. Is your interest primarily research or is it teaching? Now, you, you can't have both. I mean, I'm sure everybody's got both, but I want you to think of one that for you is most important. I want you to put your hand up when I count to three if your primary interest is, is teaching, okay? One, two, three. Wow, great. Okay, now put your hand up if your primary interest is research. One, two, three. So it's kind of about 50-50. Interesting. But I think all of you are interested in teaching and research, really, because you know if you're going to be teaching, you have to understand the evidence and the theories that inform your teaching. And if you're going to do research, you need to do research which is relevant and that contributes to the world. So they're both important. But thank you. That's useful to know. Do you have any questions that you would like answered in, in this session? I'm taking a long time to get started, but I want you to think before I talk. What's your burning questions? What are your burning questions? Do you have any questions about tasks? Do you want to uh, ask somebody next to you? Ask the person next to you, do you have any questions about TBLT? Talk to somebody, just for a minute. Everybody should be talking. Does anybody want to share their question? Topic? Puzzle? Never mind. Huh? Can we, uh, good morning, my name is Prakashit, like from Thammasat University. Uh, many uh, students and researchers uh, wonder like, if the word task in general Okay, means activities or, you know, uh, exercise, okay? And what about task-based instruction for the specific term, okay? Uh, I think that uh, there are some specific procedures that uh, teachers should follow uh, if we intend, okay, to use uh, TBLT. Okay, can you clarify on that? That is a fantastic question. Thank you. In other, wo in other words... What is a task? Is any activity a task or is a task something specific? Is there a specific methodology? Or is just anything you do in the classroom, which is kind of like an activity, automatically a task? It's a fundamental question. So important that we understand that. Thank you. And in and, and relation to that question, um, this is something I did at the uh, TBLT conference in last year. I want you to think about TBLT. Are you a novice or an expert? Give yourself a number in your head. What's your number? Ah. <laughs> if you are from, if you've got a number in your head which is uh, from eight to ten, put your hand up. Come on, Professor Boo. Come on, put your hand. Up. Simon, put your hand up. Come on. Okay. <laughs> Um, five to seven, kind of you, you know, five to seven. Okay. Okay. Um, three, three to four. 
Come on. One to two? <laughs> I think you're too humble. I think you're too humble. And there's a whole lot of people here who must be zero because your hand didn't go up. Either that or you're checking Facebook. Okay, so what is a task? Now, now he here is a really important point I want to make. And it's not on the slides, so you have to listen to me. In the field, we have this thing called task-based language teaching. T-B-L-T. Uppercase. T. Big, big T. Big B. Uh, big T. Uh, big, big L. The task-based language teaching. And that is a particular methodology. It begins with a needs analysis, identifying what target tasks your learners need to do. And then the only thing you do in the language classroom is use pedagogic versions of the target tasks that you have identified. You don't pay attention to, you don't proactively attend to grammar or language. So there's a very strong form of task-based language teaching. And that is quite... Um, Quite, quite, um, well, I'll just use the word strong. But that's not what I'm talking about. Because I've worked for long enough in Asia to know that that will not work in 80% of the classrooms. So what I'm interested in is this thing called a task. I'm interested in what this thing is that's called a task and, and I want you to not think about the task so much as to think about the opportunities for learning that you are providing. Because a task is just a vehicle. It's just one of the ways that you generate learning opportunities. So you can be teaching with tasks and you can be teaching terribly. You can be wasting your students' time. You could be teaching grammar and doing it brilliantly and doing you know and probably resulting in better learning outcomes than if you're using tasks badly. So it's very important to understand that the task itself is not a magic bullet. People sort of walk around thinking I'm a task-based language teacher. Well, that doesn't tell me very much. That doesn't tell me very much. What I want to know is what are the learning opportunities that you are creating in your classroom? A and what are those learning opportunities? Well, they are things like learners having an opportunity to, to try out the language, to notice what they don't know, to, to find resources, to, to, to be able to put to use the language that they are constructing and to continue to construct the language through using it. Now, there's a lot of research on the opportunities that you need to provide in the classroom. But I would encourage all teachers to be thinking not about tasks, but about opportunities. What do you think are the opportunities that your learners need to learn? Now, having said that, the notion of task developed out of 30, 40 years of second language acquisition research into the best kind of learning opportunities that we need to provide. So in a sense, task-based language teaching is, a, is an encapsulation of all the evidence we've got about how to learn language. Let me move on. So just a quick recap, what is a task? Uh, a a well-known definition from back in uh, 2003, Rod Ellis. It's an activity which requires learners to use language with an emphasis on meaning, in order to obtain an objective. And you'll see three key words there. Use. If I can get my... Ah, oops, sorry. Use. So the learners are using the language, doing something with it. They're conveying meanings or, or processing meanings, and there's an outcome. They're achieving something. Not just... Not just learning a bunch of new words, not just getting some exercises right. They're achieving something which is non-linguistic. So we take a look at this example. If I just make it a bit bigger for you. Okay, so this is from a Vietnamese uh, textbook. 
What do the learners have to do? Okay, do a survey. In your survey, find out how many classmates come from a nuclear family, how many live in an extended family, how many classmates have both parents working, how many classmates spend an hour a day doing housework, and so on. Is that a task? How would you know? Well, let's go back to our, um, hang on. Let's go back to our definition. Are the learners using the language? Yeah? Thumbs up? Is there a focus on meaning? Thumbs up? Come on, commit yourselves, people. Focus on meaning? Yes or no? Yes. Objective? What's the objective? You've got to present a report. You've got to get the ideas together and you've got to present a report. So there are, you know, those criteria are met. Now, so what we see here in this activity is a whole cluster of opportunities. Opportunities. What kind of opportunities? Well, when the learners have to get together in groups and they have to do a survey, the first thing they have to do is they have to write the questions. How many classmates live in a nuclear family and how many live in an extended family? So the learners have to turn that into a question. What would the question be? Do, do you live in a, an extended family or a nuclear family? Okay, that's the question, right? So they've got to think about the questions. They've got to ask the questions. They've got to pay attention to pronunciation. The other classmate has to listen and give an answer. So they have to produce the language. They have to listen to the language, produce the language, construct the sentences. And then they, they, they get the information. They've got to put it together. And they've got to decide on what will we report to the class? Well, there are half the class live in nuclear families. Half the class have both parents working. All right. So they've got to construct their report. And in the process, they won't, they won't know the words. They're not sure about the grammar. They get feedback. They look at the dictionary. They ask each other. And then they put these ideas together and they share with the class. So remember I talked about opportunities. Because it's about opportunities. What opportunities did you see? Opportunities to focus on grammar. Because they had to come up with the questions. Opportunities to ask questions. To practice asking questions. And if you ask the same question to ten people, you start to develop fluency. Opportunities for fluency development. Students have to listen to each other. Opportunities for listening, meaningful listening. Sometimes I don't know the right word to use. Sometimes my, my partner doesn't understand me. They say, what? Opportunities for feedback. Opportunities to, uh, to learn about what you're not doing very well and to get help. So you can see that my, my point is that a task is a cluster of opportunities. And your job as a teacher is to manage the opportunities. The task is just the starting point, but it's a very rich starting point.
sorry folks, whenever there's a Zoom link, it always I always have to um, do things like this, put this back into there, I think. Okay. So just a quick summary, task features. The first task feature is there's a focus, oops, a focus on communicating meaning. There's some kind of meaning exchange. The second task feature, there's some kind of gap which makes you want to listen to me and me need to talk to you because we have to fill a gap. Oh, sorry, that's not there. The learners need to rely on their own resources And finally, they have to achieve something. In addition to learning the language, what are they achieving? So there's some kind of outcome. All right, well-established principles of task-based language teaching. And I've introduced this idea of Magoo, so it's an acronym for you to remember. If you want to teach with tasks, does your activity contain these four features, M, G, double O, Magoo. Mr. Magoo was a famous cartoon character. So if we go back to the activity we were just looking at, this one here, focus on meaning, use your thumbs, use your thumbs, focus on meaning. Okay, we'll give that a tick. Is there a gap? A big gap, lots of gaps, yeah. What kind of gap, Simon? <laughs> it's an information gap. Because I don't know how many people in the class. Uh, yeah? But, ah, yes, but, but we're not talking about linguistic gaps here, right? This is not a linguistic gap. A task is, it, it is driven by a non-linguistic gap. In other words, I want to use my language to get information from you. And you want to use your language to get information from me. And that's what drives meaning. So we don't know how many people in the class come from extended families. We don't know how many kids in the class have one child working. I mean, sorry, one parent working or two parents working. So there's a genuine gap. Um, own resources. Yeah, the learners had to come up with the questions. So what's the, what are the questions we've got to ask? Then the learners had to pull the data together, and they had to write a report. Now, in the process, they can talk to the teacher, they can look at a dictionary, they can go online. So they're getting, in, I'll, I'll just come, they can get information from different places, right? But they are, they are making the choice to get that information. It has not been predetermined. And that's what it means by own resources. It means that if I don't know how to do something in the task, I look at the dictionary, I talk to the teacher, I get help from my friend, I'm getting the resources I need to do the task. And, and my search for grammar, my search for vocabulary is driven by the task. It's not driven by my need to learn words or my need to learn grammar as such. Madam, you had a question? Uh, my name is Charlotte. I'm from the Faculty of Education in Buriram Rashapat University. I'm just trying to ask with the resources that you mentioned, right? It's actually part of the task of the teacher to instruct the student if they're going to use traditionally, you said that um, you mentioned that they need to write, right? But because like uh, in a trend nowadays, we are using technology. So it's very particular for a teacher to tell them what they are going to use, right? So for me, even if they are not instructed, they usually use iPads, cell phones. So with that resources, it's very particular for, for each of individuals or lecturers to mention what are they going to use during the, the, the activity or during the test. So my question is, are we going to use um, the traditional one first? Or uh, are we going to use the trending like using the technology? So that's my, my problem nowadays. Thank you. Thank you. 
It's such a good question. I mean, it's a really good question because own resources, you're right, learners can just go to AI and, I, and AI will do most of the tasks for them. I think in this task, you're safe because AI can't do this task for you because you've got to talk to your partners. But yeah, if you're not sure how to write the question or you could, you could drop your questions into AI and ask if the grammar is correct and AI could tell you if it's the right grammar. So yeah, you've got technology can help you. But I think it's a, such an important question and everybody in this room is thinking, how do I manage my classroom with technology just moving ahead so fast, right? Yeah, so that's a, that's a really negotiable space at the moment where there's a lot of shifting understandings of how we progress in this field. Okay, I need to move on a bit faster here if I can get this. So that's what a, ta that's what a task is, an example of a task and the four criteria. What's the acronym? M, M, G, O, O, Magoo. Okay, think Magoo. So that was the that was the what is a task. This is the more the why of a task, the why of TBLT. Here's an interesting email I got from a country very close by here from a senior ministry official. He said, as you know, lack of commitment and engagement in ELT, especially in this country, is alarming. In teaching, teachers are required to finish their teaching within time limits. Classroom activities are monotonous. Students um, are required to do activities as routine. They are bored and demotivated. Teachers and learners are fixated on the target because of the exams, rather than actual use of English inside and outside the classroom. Does that ring any bells? Do you think that that might be true some, in some places in Thailand or in your country, wherever you're from? It's a challenge. You know, teachers have 42 kids in a small classroom and a very busy syllabus, and the kids don't want to learn English. They don't know very much English, and the teacher is trying to push them forward. It's a, it's a tough situation. So I think um, tasks offer us one way to move forward with this. In my previous si slide, my heading is that language teaching is in a pretty bad way in many places. And then my next heading is not least because it fails to reflect what we know of second language acquisition. So just something for you to do. Three gaps for you to fill in, please. Fill in the three gaps. First gap. Actual language use. Actual language use, use is the primary shaper of linguistic form and the foundation for language learning. Tyler and Ortega, 2018. Number two, a first usage-based tenant is that language and language learning are Meaning-based, meaning-based. So language is based, it's, it's a meaning-driven system. To develop a grammar system, learners need to engage with meaning. So to, to, to develop a grammar system, learners need to engage with meaning, right? So a grammar system is meaning-based. And we make the mistake if we think a grammar system is form-based, it's deeply connected to meanings. And if we disassociate grammar too much from meaning, we make the job harder for our learners. I've shown you this slide before if, when I was last here. This is um, a Vietnamese primary school teacher who understands the problem, and here's what she said. So this is a teacher, doesn't know about TBLT, but this is what she says about her experience. I think PPP can't enhance students' ability to use English language. It's like we force them to do what we want them to do, speak what we want them to speak. Speak what we want them to speak. In other words, 
this teacher felt like she was creating a class of robots. She felt like there was something wrong, that she was drill she was presenting these linguistic structures, practicing the structures, and then giving the learners an opportunity to use the structures, but it felt very mechanical because the students are just focusing on forms and not really meanings because meaning is always secondary. But look what happened in her class when the kids were given a task, a simple information gap task. Look what happened. Here's a couple of kids. So these are grade five kids. Their English is not very strong. And they have to, they've got an information gap activity, A and B. Student A has got some information on their, time, on their class timetable. Student B has got other information. And they have to talk to share the information. And so student one says, okay, and student one is stronger and says, okay, English teacher name. In other words, you've got the name of the English teacher. Oh, sorry, so um, ask me about the English teacher. So who is, so student two is supposed to ask student one, who is the English teacher? Who is, student two is quite weak. And student one says, English teacher name. And then student two says, who is English teacher name? Well, it's not right, but you can see that they are co-constructing English and they are being driven by meaning. Remember, meaning, gap, own resources. What's the fourth one? Meaning, gap, own resources, outcome, right? So their talk is being driven by meaning. There's a gap that they have to close and they're struggling to find their own resources to fill the gap. And they're motivated to do this because there is an outcome. The outcome is they complete the timetable. They get all the information in the timetable. M-G-double-O. Right? And it's driving the learners to pay attention to language. And then student number one says it's Miss Nung Two. Who? And then student one in the red is now going to ask student two. And look at what student one is saying here. Who, who, teach, who, who, science teacher name? Who is science teacher? Who is science teacher? Who is science teacher? What's going on? What's going on? The learner is engaging with the language, with the grammar, they're focusing on meaning. The, 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 the drive to communicate is making them think and, and they're trying out what is what is who is science teacher? Does that sound right? So they're engaged fully with the language. And then what happened later in the task? And we can see that tasks make language a living resource because this, the students finish the, the task. Koi oi, song roi, koi oi. I can't speak Vietnamese, obviously. Uh, what subject do you like best? Now, look at this. You notice that the students try to get the teacher's attention, but the teacher's busy, and they turn to each other, and they use English. What subject do you like best? I like math. What about you? I like Vietnamese. Song Roy Koi, whatever you <laughs> Vietnamese, right? Okay. What's happened here? Something quite miraculous. These kids who don't have much English, don't like English, but they're given a task and they, they do the task and at the end of the task, when nobody's listening, they keep using English because the task has given them opportunities. Opportunities to engage, to participate, to use their own resources. In other words, opportunities to invest. And so we've got this notion of investment in language learning and teachers. And when the learners invest their own resources, they become agents of their own learning. And when they become agents of the, their own learning, 
the language moves from something which is external to something which is internal. A and that is an opportunity that we should be cultivating, an opportunity to have a relationship with English which is personal, interesting, safe, and enjoyable. Just to sum up this point, so when learners do real things with language, the language becomes real to them. Right? When learners do real things with language, the language becomes real to them. It comes back to this word opportunities. Are we giving learners opportunities to do something real with language? We're going to skip that. Um, I'm now going to move on to the third of my three parts. So we're getting sort of halfway through, a little bit more than halfway through. Time for you just to take a short break. Um, not long, just a minute. But you can stand up, talk to a friend, look out the window, and I'll give you a minute. All right? Everybody just take kind of roll your shoulders, roll your head around, have a bit of a break. Today, because we started the video. Come on back, folks. Okay, let's um, let's begin again. If you would like to come back to your seats, thank you. Come on back, folks, and we're going to get started again. So before I move on to um, part three, I just wanted to open up for some discussion. If anybody has any quest questions. Any burning yeah, questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Somehow, where I stand, 
talked about. Uh, actually, I have one question and I almost forget because I was too excited. <laughs> okay, um, my question is regarding about the tax bed, uh, the TBLT and communicative language teaching. As you can, as you present the um, definition, meaning, use, and objective, I think it's like um, communicative language teaching. Do you think it is, you know, TBLT is sub theme of communicative or it is separate or you know different construct what do you think in your opinion thank you yes such a good question is tblt the same as communicative language teaching or is it a subset or what what do you think yeah subset nah. D do you know what a venn diagram is when you've got two circles and they intersect, so I think you've got CLT as one circle and you've got TBLT as another circle and they have some common ground, but they have some differences. Some of the differences are that community, if you think in terms of opportunities, what are the opportunities that CLT provides? Well, in the first place, CLT is a very general term. When I began my language teaching in China, I was a communicative language teacher. I would get my learners doing activities, maybe tasks, in groups, and I would just hope for the best that they were learning something. So this was quite a strong version of CLT, which says that the, the, the theoretical implication of strong C, CLT is that adults have very strong implicit learning abilities and that all you have to do is give them natural learning environments and they will acquire the language. That's the assumption behind strong CLT. And it is wrong. It is the wrong theoretical assumption. Research in SLA tells us very clearly that adults, adult learners, you know, post-puberty post learners or post-childhood learners need opportunities for explicit learning. They need to be able to explicitly and consciously look at the language, notice things about the language, compare things about the language, and use those conscious learning processes. Now, TBLT builds those explicit learning opportunities into the notion of task, right? In a way that CLT did not articulate. So if you think of the, yeah, so strong CLT is based on a very strong non-interventionist approach to language teaching. Give the learners act. I had a I had a teacher from uh, Indonesia in my class, and uh, in my uh, T master's class on TBLT, and he was amazed. He said, "We were taught as communicative language teachers not to pay attention to grammar." He said, "We were taught not to do that," which is a mistake. Um, task-based language teaching adopts the, the the idea that we do not have a natural we don't do not have the same ability as young children to acquire learn language naturally we need to apply conscious attention we need to be we need to notice things about the language and then have opportunities to use that noticing in practice And those assumptions are built into TBLT. Okay. Any other questions? In, in a sense, when you're thinking about language teaching methods, you can think of the, the strong non-interventionist method, which is just give learners, this is like Stephen Krashen, let the learners have lots of input, just natural learning, and they will naturally learn. As a teacher, you just provide a rich, meaningful environment, non-interventionist. And over here, we have the strong interventionist position, which is teach the language, and the learners will learn it. Teach the language rule by rule, system by system, structure by system, by structure, and the learners will learn it. 
we know from many years of evidence that position doesn't work and this position doesn't work. Teachers who teach the grammar don't produce learners who've learnt the grammar. They produce learners who can pass a test, but they can't use the language productively. Teachers who just spend all their time doing communication produce learners who can communicate but have no idea how the language works and don't use it very accurately. In the middle here, we've got task-based language teaching, which, which acknowledges the role of some kind of intervention, but also acknowledges that we need a rich context for learners to use the language naturally. All right, current trends in, in um, TBLT. If we go to the task journal, which is two years old, Here's the most, uh, sorry, that's a 2022 issue. So what are the current trends? What's happening in the field? Well, one way to find out is just to see what research is being produced. Self-determination theory and tasks. So a focus on learners and how tasks can give learners a stronger sense of self-efficacy. So a learner focus. Speaking tasks and assessment. Using tasks for assessment. Synchronous online learner-learner interaction, so technology. And um, a, a, an article I was involved in, which we'll talk about in a minute, using tasks in rural China. Looking at uh, last year's in, um, um, issue. So the first article is about teacher education. So how do we educate teachers? If you're teaching in a master's program, if you're teaching in a university, how do we teach teachers to, uh, to use tasks? Plurilingual instruction. Um, oral oral task-based task -based teaching for young learners. Task-based teaching and writing. Task-based teaching and motivation. So you can see quite a lot of themes coming through here. And my point is, and so on it goes, my point is that you pick any trend in applied linguistics, including the trend the lady, the, the um, madam over here asked about, which is technology, and you will find that trend in TBLT. So, you know, there are lots of trends in TBLT. Um, we see, for example, translanguaging. Well, translanguaging in tasks is an important trend. Right? There's a lot of interesting work taking place on that. Formulaic sequences, if you're a vocabulary person. Formulaic sequences and task-based language teaching. Engagement. Very interesting new area that I'm going to talk about in a minute. What's the level of engagement in a classroom when the learners are doing tasks versus non-tasks? Or when they're doing one kind of task compared to another kind of task? Engagement. Technology. How is technology shifting the way we teach with tasks? What are the implications for task-based language teaching when learners have generative AI at their fingertips? When learners can, can get their, lap, their, their cell phones to do the thinking for them? And, and this is a, a huge trend that I'm not going to talk about so much today but it's one that I just want to acknowledge. And of course, assessment. Many teachers I talk to say, I really like task-based language teaching, but, but what? But the, t the exam is multi-choice. The exam is grammar-based. The exam is reading and answering questions. So assessment is a big issue for TBLT. But I want to take you through two trends. Uh, which is all I've got time for. The first trend is tasks, emotions, engagement, and well-being. There's a really interesting trend in applied linguistics at the moment to understanding learner emotions. Who's interested in positive psychology? And I think some people here have been some, you know, positive psychology. It's quite a big area of growth, understanding understanding well-being. 
how do we make classrooms a place where there is a genuine experience of well-being? When the students come to our class with enthusiasm and they leave the class with enthusiasm. They leave the class feeling good about themselves. They leave the class being stronger. And, and there's a growing recognition in language teaching that, that maybe we went too far in the cognitive, cognitive direction with our research. It's all about cognition, noticing and attention, and all this kind of stuff. Lots of cognitive theories of second language acquisition. Then we've got the social theories, sociocultural theory, social theories of language teaching and learning. But emotions, kind of just invisible, as if they don't exist, as, as, as if learners don't feel something. Just some recent publications that have, that have come out in this area, and I've just highlighted in yellow here one that I particularly, I love. This is Jean-Marc Duali, a, a, a wonderful um, French researcher. The learner emotions that oil the cogs, oil the cogs in TBLT, which is a, what a fantastic name for an article. When you write articles for publication, think about really great names for your articles, right? You know, you know what the cogs are? The cogs in a machine are the little wheels, like in the old-fashioned watches, the little cogs that go round. You might have to, if you're not sure what a cog is, you can find and you need oil on the cogs to make the machine go smoothly. And, and Jean, Jean-Marc Duali says, you know, emotions, learner emotions that, that oil the cogs of TBLT. So I want to give you an example of a, um, a little activity which I think taps into emotions but is also a rich learning opportunity. So this is something called a happiness poem, a performance poem. And, and what you do with your learners, you ask your learners to think about, for you, what is happiness? And in this case, the learners have to complete the sentence using the gerund form. So they have to use the gerund form. So there's a bit of a focus on grammar. doesn't have to be. So happiness is what? For you. Huh? Finishing the presentation in time. Very good. <laughs> Can everybody think of a way to finish that sentence? Happiness is. Now, quickly turn to two other, two or three other people in small groups. Share what your happiness is. Share what it is. Tell tell your partners. Happiness is. Happiness is nothing, having nothing to worry about. Right, so the three of you can share. Now, with this activity, so here is the task. That's just the warm-up. That's the warm-up. Now, now you have to create a performance poem. So in your groups of four, you've got to present a performance poem whereby you actually you decide together who's going to speak first, second, third, fourth, and you decide how, how, how are we going to perform this poem? Are we going to, you, you know? So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes in groups of three or four to create your happiness performance poem. Do you understand? So find you, you need to be in groups of three or four. And I want you together to share what happiness is and then decide how you will perform together up here. Could I? Huh? Well, you, you need to perform. Okay, performance poem. Okay, yeah. I. I let me just come back together. Do you know what a performance poem is? You don't know what a performance poem is. Right. So each of you has got one sentence. Happiness is, da-da-da, happiness is, da-da-da, happiness is. You've got to work out 
if you stand up the front here and you perform, all four of you, how are you going to perform it? Are you going to perform it? Uh, happiness is... No, 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 no. Are you going to perform it? Happiness is... And then the next person and the next person. And you've got to think about a way to do it smoothly. So do your part. So three together, quick. Okay. D d d is there a group that would like to perform their perform their poem? Any performers in the room? Come on. Come on. Hi. Right. Fantastic. All right. Performance. Yay. So you have to have the microphone. I can't. Huh? I can't. What is your happiness? Um, I think my happiness is staying with my beloved people, talking with my beloved supervisee and uh, supervisor. And where's my supervisor? Okay, um, um, spending the time with the, uh, you know. Spending time with the wonderful movie, funny movies, and like that. And what about what about you? Yours? Yeah. Um, my happiness is like when I have nothing to worry about. Something like when sometimes they stay at home and when we think about something about work or everything, it's um, no problem or something, not, nothing to worry about. This is a happiness. It's a simple one. And another one is, um, I like to see just myself. One, just oh, one. Just one. Just okay. one. One, one, one. Come on. Okay. Move, move. What is your happiness? Uh, the, the most important thing for me, I think, it is about healthy. Because if the first time, like, we get healthy, and then after that, you can do everything further. For example, like, the finish your thesis and your PhD. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. So the idea. Thank you very much. Now the the idea with this is that as a group, you you have to work out now what are we going to say, what order, and and it was very interesting because you turned it into a conversation. So what's your happiness, right? Other groups do different things. I'll show you this group here. Two, one, roll! My happiness is watching my favorite movie. What is your happiness? My happiness is getting what all what I want. What's your happiness? Oh, my happiness is having meals with my family. Huh? And yours? My happiness is embracing my loved one in my arms. Ah. Oh. Oh. What did you notice there? What did you notice about the way they were using language? Huh? They repeat. They repeat. They're sharing. Their whole bodies are involved. It's embodied language. Did you see they were using gestures? And they was, their body was involved? You know, in our classrooms, we treat English like it's disembodied. But actually, when we use language... We're using our face, our body, our gestures. And, and you wonder why our learners find it hard to use English? 
because we've taken out all of the linguistic, all of the non-linguistic resources that we use naturally to communicate in the language. Now, the interesting thing about this, this task, if you think about that one word I would like you to go away with today, and that word is opportunities. What were the learning opportunities? Now, I, I did it very quickly, but normally I would give you five, 10 minutes in your groups so you share with each other, and then you have to negotiate who's first, who's second, who's third, and then you rehearse, and then you play around with it, and then you rehearse again, and then you perform. So you can see there's a lot of opportunities, opportunities to focus on language, opportunities to engage with each other, opportunities to rehearse, opportunities to be fluent, opportunities to use the language with an objective. Interestingly enough, if you take that activity and you do it with different groups, every group will come up with a different way of doing it. One of the groups I did this with last week in my master's class, they decided that they were going to use the same grammatical pattern. So the first one says happiness is cooking is something without something. Cooking without doing the dishes. Happiness is eating without worrying about getting fat. Happiness is, well, you know, you can fill in the gaps, right? So what happened? The task was an opportunity for learners to think about grammar, but it was a natural thinking about grammar to express meanings. So it was meaning that was driving grammar and not the other way around. And then they get up and perform the activity. Uh, where did I put my... And that activity is designed not only to generate these language learning processes, but it also creates well-being. Our learners are thinking about, huh, what makes me happy? And that can generate an energy in the classroom. There's a very kind of interesting trend in research at the moment, um, looking at uh, physiological measures of well-being. So what happens when our learners do one kind of activity compared to another in terms of their physiological response? There's something, some, something called galvanic skin, um, galvanic skin measures, indicators. Galvanic skin. When we are experiencing something intense or something that excites us, our skin generates more electricity because the sweat glands kind of, you know, they, they activate. There's a little bit more moisture. And so the elect electro electrical currents move across our skin. So when you put something on a, a little measure, electrical pulse measure on the learner's fingers or on their palm, you can measure the extent to which an activity in the classroom is exciting them or making them feel good by virtue of the electrical currents that are being picked up on the skin. So measuring well-being in the classroom in relation to different activities is one of the current trends in language learning. Of course, you can also use um, pulse. So taking learners' pulses, does their pulse speed up or drop in different task conditions? You can use um, brain monitors, which is a bit more intrusive, looking at what, act, what areas of the brain are activated in different tasks. But this is part of, part of trying to understand how tasks impact on learner emotions. And... Um, where is it here? If anybody's interested in, in this area, um, the Lambert, Aubrey, and Boy uh, book is well recommended. It just came out. Um, the role of the learner in task-based language teaching, theory, and research methods. Focusing on the learner in language teaching.
So the second trend, and this is the last main part of the talk, and then we will open up for questions. The second trend is, that I think is um, very important in TBLT is tasks in diverse contexts. TBLT in diverse contexts. I don't know if you can see this, but on the, the far side of the column here is a list of the characteristics of the typical context in which early task-based research took place. So the, the field was established in this kind of context, pre-sessional programs in the US. What do we know about these programs? Well, small classes, lots of resources, lots of opportunities to use English beyond the classroom. The courses are quite intense. The learners might be studying English for four hours a day, five days a week, for two weeks, three weeks, six weeks, 10 weeks, very intense. Um, the teachers often have high proficiency. The teachers are often highly qualified. The learners are often young, educated adults, right? So most of the research in the first 20 years of task-based language teaching took place in this kind of context. And then you're, you're teaching in a rural school in, in Thailand. And you read this research and you say, oh, this tasks must be good. And you try it out in your rural school with 42 students in your classroom, and it's a complete disaster. Well, 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 surprise, surprise. Because there was an assumption, a kind of a Western assumption that, ah, if it's good for this context, it's good for other contexts. But if we look at, by contrast, an elementary school in China, Look at the differences here. Large classes, not many resources, no exposure to English beyond the classroom. The learners have maybe two or three hours of English per week. The teachers may have a bachelor's degree in English, but it's a bachelor's degree in English studies. They would have studied linguistics and literature, but they've never studied how to teach. So you've got teachers who don't know how, they haven't been trained to teach. And the learners are learning because they just have to. They don't want to, they have to. So you can see everything, everything is different. So how do we, how do we adapt TBLT to these different contexts, to the kind of context you are in? And Chris van der Branden, a very well-known Belgian researcher, you know, makes this point that to become a research pedagogy, to become a pedagogy that genuinely works and is genuinely useful to Thailand, China, Africa, Middle East, we, we need research in these different contexts, different countries, different continents, different kinds of learners, different kinds of programs. But when we talk about context, I just want to make one quick Quick point, what do we mean when we talk about context? And this is from a, a 2021 uh, book a chapter that I wrote. Context. Well, one way, one, way to th one way to think about context is looking at TBLT in diverse contexts. So you might be a researcher in Thailand or China, and you might do TBLT research but it's not about the context. You might be doing an experimental study. You might have 50 learners and you're looking at their performance of one task compared to another task, right? So it's a kind of quasi-experimental. It's, it's designed to uh, build theory. It's designed to build our understanding of TBLT. You, you use convenience sampling. Um, it's um, quasi-experimental in design, but it actually tells us nothing about the context. And that's fine, but just be careful. Just because a, a study was situated in Thailand or China or somewhere else, it doesn't mean it's about that context because context in these kind of studies is usually controlled. 
On the other hand, we have TBLT research about diverse contexts. It's actually about the context. And the purpose is to evaluate, well, how well does TBLT work in this context, in a rural primary school in Thailand, in an urban private school in Shanghai, how well, in a university in, 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 here in uh, Burirat, Burirat. And here we can also distinguish between top-down studies um, and bottom-up studies. So top-down studies uh, look at the evaluation of curricula from a top-down perspective. Has the curricula been successful? Ha have the teachers done what they're supposed to do? Has the policy worked? Uh, but my particular interest is in the bottom-up studies. And so this is where I think we have the most potential to make a, a difference at the moment in TBLT. That is participatory uh, or interventionist studies that, that emphasize improving TBLT in particular contexts, improving and adapting. And the way we measure the, the um, uptake of TBLT is through micro-evaluation of tasks, which I'll talk about in a, in a minute. In other words, we still need research from people like you about rich contexts, about diversity, about how TBLT works, for whom, where, when, and why. Now, one of the ways we can um, get some in insights into whether it works is to do what's called micro-evaluation of, of, of um, tasks. And this is uh, available to anybody in the room. And there are three different ways we can evaluate tasks. First, we can look at the student response. Did the students enjoy the task? Did they experience engagement? Were they motivated? That's the first criteria. And if you're designing a research study, this is something to think about. It's quite easy to collect data. You can use an exit, a self-report. You can use exit slips at the end of the lessons to get the students' perspectives. Or you can do a focus group, or you can interview the learners. Or you can get the learners to write written reflections. So getting the students' perspectives. Number two. How did the learners perform? in the task-based lesson. How did they perform? Did they do what the task asked them to do? This is called response-based evidence. So we're looking at written responses. So if, if there was a task sheet, you collect the task sheets. Or if they did the task online, you look at the online um, outcomes of the task. Maybe you observe what's happening. So as a teacher, you're observing whether the learners are on task or off task, and you're using a checklist, or maybe you're observing a recording. So we're looking at student perceptions first, then we're looking at student response, and finally, we're looking at development. So what are the stu did the students like the task? Did they perform the task well? And finally, did they learn anything? What did they learn? Is there evidence that they have acquired something from this? And this is called learning-based evidence. Um, we can use uptake charts. An uptake chart is something very simple. As a teacher, you might say, okay, these are the four criteria that I want, to, I I want the learners to learn against. So I want pronunciation. I want them to learn something about pronunciation. Some new words. Uh, maybe they've learned some new strategies. Maybe they've learned some new grammar. So an uptake chart is you just give them these categories and the learners have to fill in what, what new words did I learn? What did I learn about grammar? What did I learn about my pronunciation? Right? This is called an uptake chart. Very simple. So the learners report on their own learning. And there's evidence to show that that works quite well as a research instrument. Pre and post tests or transcriptions of classroom recordings. These are all evidence for what learners have actually acquired in the task.
Okay, just a reflective pause. That's my son and his fiance on a beach. Just as the sun was setting at the in, in uh, New Zealand. Okay, so this is the we're, we're coming into the last part of the talk here. And I want to I want to illustrate this point with a case study from China. Now, at, at um, Surakhan last university last year, I might have covered some of this, so it might be a repeat for some of you, but we'll see. So here's an example of TBLT research in diverse contexts. Jing Yishuan was interested in ha what happens with rural teachers who don't know anything about tasks in a resource poor context in a poor and this is the poorest part of china gansu province right in a rural school what about these teachers is task a task any use for these teachers so she collected a really rich set of data and, and, and here i'm looking at implications for research because i think this is not only about teaching but it's about this is this is a really good example of a very rich piece of research. She went to the school. She lived in the area for a, for a semester or for a school term. She got data sets from outside the school, talking to the taxi drivers, talking to the community, living in the community, meeting the teachers outside the school. Inside the school, she observed lessons. She taught with the teachers. She planned lessons with the teachers. She met the administrative st staff. She met with the teachers at lunchtime and talked to them. Um, she observed the teachers. She talked to the students in the lunchroom. And she was very good. She didn't record the data, but when she had a meeting, she would quickly write, after the meeting, she would write down the conversations. So very naturalistic data. Very rich ethnographic data. Now, let's look at an example of what, what she saw in the classes. So this is a teacher, uh, Yan Lao Su, um, teaching a class. This is from the textbook. So the, the students have these pictures, and they have to ask and answer. What did Carol do? She picked some strawberries. So I'm going to ask you, what did Carol do? And you can look at, tell me about picture B. What did Carol do? She's milking, <laughs> milking, I don't know. She's milking the cow. Okay. Uh, picture F, what, what, did, what, did, what did Carol do? Uh, a, a, F, um, the, she's talking to the farmer. Yeah, she's talking to the farmer, yeah. She's in, some, in somewhere where, where I did this, they said she's talking to a cowboy. So I thought it was a cowboy because of the hat. A student from China student from China, but you're right, it's a farmer, right? So this is what happened in the classroom. This is what was happening with this teacher before she knew anything about tasks. Here's what she's doing. So Jan Lasser shows the picture on a slide. Pairs of students come to the front and answer questions. So here's student A and here's student B. What did Carol do? She rode a horse. Right? And then the teacher says, change roles. So now B asks A, what did Carol do? What did Carol do? And what do you think that A is going to say? I've got all these pictures. A says she rode a horse. She rode a horse. So what does that tell you? The students are like robots. There's no meaning. Not much meaning. It's just kind of, I need to just say the right thing. I need to say the right thing. What did Cal do? She rode a horse. What did Cal do? She rode a horse. 
there's an opportunity for creativity. There's an opportunity to use a different picture. But in this kind of classroom where you're performing in front of the class, don't take risks. Don't use the language creatively. Be safe. Right? In other words, the teacher is shutting down opportunities. Remember that word opportunities? What are the, op what are the learning opportunities here? Very small. Very small. So much potential. So few opportunities. You know this guy? Lev Vygotsky? Lev Vygotsky. A teacher who tries to do this usually accomplishes nothing but empty verbalism. A parrot-like repetition of words uh, by the child simulate, whoops, I better move away, simulating a knowledge of the corresponding concepts but actually covering up a vacuum. Now, this teacher was then introduced to TBLT. Let's look at what happened once she had learnt a little bit about TBLT. So here's an example from the textbook. Two reading passages. The students have to read the passages and answer the comprehension questions. Very boring. How is reading normally taught? Well, the teacher would normally look at those passages and highlight the language, translate the language point, explain the grammar, and then do the comprehension questions. Now think of Magoo. Think of M G double O. Meaning? Not much. Gap? No. Own resources? No. Outcome? No. Cross, 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 cross. Nothing is happening there which is close to the opportunities that are available through TBLT. Let's look at what they did to change the lesson. Okay, here's what they did differently. Step one, work in groups. Step two, read the diaries from Helen and Jim and do what? Do what? Write some questions. Write some questions to test the teacher. Wow. Think of Magoo. Meaning? 100%. Gap? What's, what's the gap? The gap is we're going to test the teacher to see if she knows the answer. Right? Own resources? Own resources? Who creates the sentences? The students. Who chooses what they will, what topics they will ask about? The students. Own resources. Outcome? Can we trick the teacher? Can we, can we, can, will the teacher answer all our questions? Right? M-G-O-O. -O. Very powerful. Because it's a set of learning opportunities. Look at what happened. Oh, sorry. A bit more. So, Jan Lausa, if she doesn't know the answer, she might uh, ask for some help. And the group, hey, the group that asks the most questions is the star group for the day. So, there's a bit of a kind of a, you know, ga gamification going on as well. All right. Why, why design this activity? Well, number one, the students didn't enjoy reading. And and are you surprised? Are you surprised that they didn't enjoy reading? When the teacher translates the grammar, talks about the blah, 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 you know, just boring. The teacher struggled to teach reading. The teacher was using grammar translation and the class was dying, right? And the teacher knew they were dying, but it's the only way the teacher knew how to teach. And the students didn't know how to ask, uh, ask questions. So this was a learning gap. And, and perhaps the most important dimension of this is that, you know, for teachers in rural schools in Thailand and elsewhere, 
they often don't get opportunities to use English. So their English goes like this. You know, they leave the university, they use, they've got their training, they go to teach in a primary school, they teach these young kids, and their English level drops and drops and drops. So this is an opportunity for the teacher to use her English, to use, to use teaching English, to become better at English. So here's, what, here's some of the questions. Now the students talked in groups, that they came up with their questions, they tried to write them, and then the teacher would go around and just check the grammar, or the, and my PhD student helped with the grammar, and then they wrote the questions down and handed the questions to the teacher, but they also read the, the quest, spoke the questions as well. <coughs> what did Helen see on her way to the museum? What kind of robot did she like? Can robot fight? Why was it so dark? These are rural kids. They've never been to a museum. They don't know what a museum is. What gift did Helen buy her parents? Now, what's interesting here? Half of these questions, you can't find the answers in the text. text. In other words, the students were thinking creatively. So it, it says down here um, with Helen, I went to the gift shop and bought some lovely gifts for my, for my parents. And the student says, what kind of gifts did she buy? Well, we don't know, so the teacher has to make it up. Right? Can robots fight? Oh, it's not in the text. So you can see learners shifting in their relationship with English. Opportunities, opportunities, opportunities. The students had opportunities to do what? Work collaboratively. Think creatively. Write their own questions. Get feedback on their questions. Listen to other students' questions. Hear the teacher talk. And, and all of these processes draw the learner's attention into the text they're reading. Now they're reading for meaning. Now they're, if, if they come across words they don't understand, okay, I need to find those words because I need to write a question. So they're motivated by an objective, which, got, which is a non-linguistic objective beyond the text. Ron, uh, Roy Kellen, an Australian educationalist, made this point. The most crucial parts in a discussion are not the questions the students, sorry, are the questions the students ask, not the questions they answer. How many questions do your students ask? Probably the teacher does 80%. Now, I now want to just move into a, a slightly different part of this, because if you remember that Jing's data set was very rich ethnographically, and she struggled in terms of writing an article and in terms of writing a thesis, because here's the conventional structure of a thesis, right? Introduction, literature review, methodology, results, findings, conclusions. Didn't feel right. So in the early draft of her thesis, this is what it looked like. The story, entry to the school, building trust, observing lessons, interacting with staff. So this is an interesting implication for research. If we're doing research in classrooms, qualitative research about diversity, what kind of reporting or publications or theses could we be writing? And this is what her final, almost the final structure of her thesis. So each of these bullet points is a chapter. Look at the structure of the thesis. How I learned about TBLT. The start of a PhD journey, understanding China. The road to Eastgate School. When she got to this province, she went to different schools to try and find a school to do the research. And, and the process of talking about each school, 
became a whole chapter because some schools were welcoming, some schools were hostile, some schools were unusual. And just talking about that part of that part of a PhD where you're trying to find a research site itself is really interesting. Oh, and and you know, are you a spy? One of the schools was in our, you know, are you here to spy on us? The teacher's dilemma, I don't know how to teach, and so on. So a very innovative way of doing a thesis, which is more true to the kind of data that she collected there. Um, so we're going to finish at half past 11? Yeah. So I, I'm going to skip over this, um, this case study and just draw to a close. Get out of this. Okay, so just a few minutes to, to wrap up. A few minutes to wrap up. So, what have we done so far? We've looked at what is a task, why TBLT, and some current trends. And I've talked about two trends. One is the relationship between tasks and emotions, trend number one. And trend number two is researching tasks in diverse contexts, appreciating diversity and finding a role for tasks in diverse contexts. Now, there's one thing I want to say about this, which is really important, that there is an orthodox form of TBLT, TBLT, which is very orthodox. You have to do it a certain way. But I think for you, you need to be bringing task-based language teaching forwards by adapting and adopting it to suit your contexts. So if we, if we put TBLT away and we think about tasks, just tasks, where can you use tasks? How do you use tasks with writing, with reading, with listening, with speaking? Tasks. Magoo, being adaptive and creative is very important. Where to from here? So what matters for researching tasks in diverse contexts? Well, first of all, the obvious thing that is that context matters, complexity matters, exploration and discovery matters, stories matter. Remember Jing's thesis? She turned her thesis into a story. And, and Palgrave Macmillan have now accepted that thesis as a book for publication. So we'll be publishing that book, that, that thesis, as a full book uh, next year. Subjectivities. What really matters is understanding the inner lives of learners and teachers. Teachers and learners are part of what we're doing. If you go back, if you go to much of the research, much of the research in task-based language teaching in the last 40 years, you can't find teachers. They're invisible. It's, a, it's as if tasks happen in a vacuum. Right? All of the research, you know, by Peter Skeen and all, you know, Michael Long, Rod Ellis, wonderful researchers, but they treat tasks as if they happen in a vacuum. Teachers make a difference to, to tasks. We need to understand what teachers are thinking and what they're doing. And we need to be reflective and reflexive about that. There are, in terms of research, there are many rich methodological options if research is your interest. Case studies, diary studies, think aloud protocols, action research, phenomenology, longitudinal studies, ethnographic practice, autoethnography. Are you familiar with autoethnography? This is where auto is the self, you know, like an autobiography is my biography of myself. And autoethnography auto is an ethnography of myself. And there's a growing research, body of research using autoethnography. So you can be the, the researcher and you are the subject of your research, right? 
you are researching yourself and your own practice. And narrative inquiry. Narrative inquiry is seeking to understand the stories by which we understand our experience. We use stories in our lives. We have narratives about who we are and why we are what we are and how we teach. John Dewey, a famous uh, philosopher from, I guess, 120 years or so ago, we do not learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on experience. So the power of reflection as a source of evidence in research. Um, three tips for making research relevant to context. One, if you're doing a, a, a PhD study or a research study in a particular context, I would argue that you need to begin in the first phase of your study with a situation analysis. Look at the policy, look at the curriculum, look at the classes, look at the school, do a descriptive situation analysis, kind of like a needs analysis. And then if you want to introduce an innovation like TBLT, do that next. The good thing about this is you get a publication from here and you get at least one publication from here, right? Too many studies do this, but they don't do this. When you do the situation analysis, you discover interesting things about the real world of the classroom. When you're studying teacher cognition, please just don't use a survey. Please just don't send out a survey to 150 teachers. Teacher cognition isn't just in the head. It's what they do. It's what they do, it's what they say about they do, it's what they know, it's what they understand, it's what they value. But if you only look at what teachers say they do and not what they do, you're missing a whole part of the picture. So I think we make the mistake in teacher cognition of not giving enough strength, not giving enough attention to what they do. Because what they do triangulates with what they say they do. Number three, I think a very close analysis and thick description of cases of individual teachers is a very rich source of data. The teacher, the students, what the teacher does, what they say about what they do, what they know, and what the students think. Very rich source of data in cases like that. Um, I think I'm going to skip over the pra I'm going to skip over the practical steps here. Oh. I just want you to remember remember this guy, Magoo. Magoo represents opportunities, opportunities to learn. A task is only valuable to the extent that it releases learning opportunities, whether it's through technology, whether you use AI whether it's with paper, whatever. The task is not the issue. The opportunities are what's critical. And a key question is, do my learners have rich opportunities to function not as learners, but as language users? You remember those Chinese kids who wrote the questions? Remember that? You know, do robots fight? Why is a museum dark? What did Carol buy her parents? The learners have shifted from the role of a, a learner sitting there listening to the teacher, and they're using the language. Their identity has changed. So a task shifts the learner's identity. And that's a very profound shift from learner to user. Um, so I'm going to finish just with a, a quote from Fullen and Scott, Michael Fullen, very famous um, American educationalist. Good ideas with no ideas on how to implement them equals wasted time. So TBLT, good ideas. But if we don't understand how they're being implemented, and if we don't understand how they can be adopted and adapted in your context, then we're wasting time. So understanding implementation, 
how do we practice tasks in Thailand, TBLT in Thailand? Crucial. I wanted to thank Jing uh, Yishuan, my wonderful uh, PhD student from China, and uh, Yoshi Nishikawa. We didn't get to her study. And um, on that note, I would say, uh, and that's uh, time for some questions. If you're not utterly exhausted. Thank you very much, Professor, Professor, Dr. Jonathan. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask our speaker. Oh, you all look so tired. Um, got any tough questions? Another one over here. With the research types of research that you mentioned, it's very interesting with the ethnographic ethnography research. I've been learning with that during my PhD, uh, during my PhD degree, uh, academic uh, subjects. With regards to the ethnography, uh, can we study about the learners, the life of the learners? Because just to mention a while ago, you talk about the the life of the teacher in the community, right? How we can focus on in studying with the learners and how does the ethics apply with regards to the culture? Thank you. Fantastic question. So the question is about the learners. How can we how can we study the learners? Well, I mean, ethics it depends on each institution. Um, I've got a I've got a PhD student from China uh, who's about to begin her data collection on emotions in the, uh, emotions in the classroom and the speaking classroom in China. So she had to get quite a bit of ethics clear, very hard to get ethics clearance, but she managed to get it. It was okay. But yeah, you just you know the requirements of your institution are unique in each context. It's possible. It depends on what you're asking them to do. So in her case, for example, she is getting the learners at the end of every lesson. They've got a, a, a two-minute exit slip where they have to just tick the emotions they've experienced in the lesson, right? So at the end of every lesson, they just tick the emotions. And then she's got focus groups of students where they talk about their experience of being in a speaking class, you know, and whether they enjoy it or whether they're nervous, they feel afraid, they feel bored, you know, right? So trying to get an understanding of their emotions. I mean, she's also got another slightly longer survey she does at the end of each lesson where the learners have got a list of all the key emotions yeah, and they have to tick which emotions have I experienced today in my lesson. So, I mean, that's, that's how you get learners' input, exit slips, um, the micro-evaluation of tasks I talked about before, learners' perceptions, did I enjoy the lesson? Learners' performance, did the learners do the task successfully? And learning outcomes, what evidence is there that the learners have learned pre and post testing? I think we, the book that I cited you before, the 2023 book by Lambert et al. Um, on the learner in task-based language teaching is a really exciting new direction. So looking at the learners, as the end consumers of tasks, what do they think? What do they understand from what they're doing? One of my PhD students, uh, she, she interviewed her learners um, as well as the teachers and observed the classes and did some fantastic work there. And it was very interesting. When the, le when the teachers were introducing a task, they would spend the first 10 minutes modeling the task telling the students how to do it and modeling the task. And when she interviewed the students, you know what they said? They said, we wish the teacher would stop doing that. They said, we want to do the task ourselves. They said, we want to be creative, but the teacher spends so long telling us how to do the task, we kind of lose interest. right? So that's an interesting thing for a teacher to understand. Oh, maybe I should do this differently. Thank 
you so much. Is there any more questions from the audience for this morning's session? If there's one, I could keep on talking forever. Mm -hmm. There's one more thing, madam, I'd like to say in terms of ethnography. The, the point I made up here that, that I wanted to push, you know, for your, for your senior leadership is that in terms of thesis structure, we've got a problem. Because if you are, because our thesis structure typically is, is structured around quantitative, traditional, science-based design, right? Introduction, literature review, method, results, findings, discussion. Only. But ethnography doesn't fit into that. Narrative inquiry doesn't fit into that. We, we need a different model of thesis structure to allow thesis students to be able to express the true nature of their research appropriately. It's hard to do because I know universities have very rigid structures, but I think that's a future direction to allow some flexibility. Thank you very much, Professor. So if there is no more question, oh, there's questions. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your insightful keynote speech. Um, considering the acronym uh, MGU, yes. All right. Con considering that acronym, uh, the language that is the resources that is own resources of the students are very vital in tax base. So also considering that we have urban schools, for example, and rural schools where they have different resources. So should it be very important for the teacher to signal to learners about to signal about the importance of the resources that they have to use to the student before the class, or the teacher just have to, to teach and not signaling them, and then it is time for, 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 the, for the learners to make use of resources and the resources are not available. So what's your take about that? It's, it's another amazing question, and we could spend a lot of time on that. So the question is, you know, if if in a task learners have to use their own resources, and that means that the teacher doesn't start by teaching the grammar and practicing the structures to use in the task. So we, 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 we're, we're trying to avoid too much of that. So where do the learners get their resources from? Where do they get them from? One answer is you do an input-based task before an output-based task. That is to say that the learners, okay, I'll give you an example from one of my students. Instead of a PPP, the teacher played a very simple recording of two students talking about their school timetable. What time do you have English? I, on Wednesday at two o'clock. So they, and the learners have to listen and they have to fill in the timetable when they listen, right? So that's an input-based task in which the learners are are getting the resources they need, but they're still doing a task because they're hearing the sentences. And then the next step is the learners have to do an information gap task with another timetable. And, and the evidence that we've got from that study showed that the learners were able to take the, 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 the ideas and the structures from the input-based listening task and use them in the output task without any drilling but they made mistakes and they struggled and they had to help each other. But when they're making mistakes and struggling, they're building linguistic muscles because it's their own language they're constructing in the process. Don't know if I've answered the question quite, but they can get resources in lots of ways. You know, it depends on the task. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's so much more I could say about that, but. Maybe we can talk later, Smith. 
Ajahn Piki. Um, regarding for my research, um, I mean like my thesis as well, I also do um, the ethnographic research in the mm -hmm. classroom. And then, thank you. <laughs> Um, regarding my thesis dissertations, I'm also do the research with relevance to um, the microethnographic research in the classroom. And then, um, you know, um, when we collect the data, like we are uh, on participation, right? So we just sometimes we just collect the data by just um, like make a audio recording, or maybe some people they use the um, like video recording as well. So, um, what do you think about the um, obse observer paradox? That maybe sometimes we cannot get the real data because, like, whenever we want to observe their linguistic or their conversations, and then they try to pretend to, you know, like give the perfect conversation. So what do you think about it? How can we, you know, get the real and raw data from our observation like this? Yeah, one of the ways one of the ways to do that is just to make to make observation very familiar. So if you wanted to collect data in a teacher's classroom, then you spend a week in the classroom just be becoming part of the furniture so that you they no longer notice that you're there. And in my experience in collecting data in classrooms, after a day, the teacher forgets you're there. You know, they, 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 at first they might be thinking, oh, I better behave. But after a while they just forget and you're just part of the furniture. So that's one way to control the, what, you, what you've called the observer's paradox. The, the other way is to acknowledge and build that in, and talk about it with the teacher, ask them whether they change their practices. I, I really think the... Observer's paradox is is overrated in language classrooms. If you, unless you are a um, a senior, you know, sitting in a junior teacher, and they're freaked out if you're there. But if you're a colleague or someone else, and there's, there's they're not being judged, they know they're not being judged. You've developed a, a good rapport with the teacher. Um, I don't see it as a problem. Thank you so much, Kat. I mean, certainly in China, when when I when we do research in China, teachers in China are always being observed. They're doing lesson study. You know, it's just part of their lives. So they don't mind if somebody else comes in the class. Well, it happens all the time. Uh, my question regarding to your question about the um, how should I say the resources? As you mentioned, actually, it's not that clear for me. A little bit mm. when you say. Never mind. But what I would like to say is that maybe uh, uh, the word, I'm not sure whether I'm, I understand it correctly or not. When the student collect the information from, you know, different friends, so meaning that the student build their own resources and that resources supposed not to similar with other students, right? So in this case, it's going to be, student going to have different resources not the same resources as teacher provide. So it leading back to that question that we cannot trigger or, you know, <laughs> provoke the student to go to the same direction, right? Is that what you're trying to say? So I just would like to clarify on this point. Yeah. <laughs> Again, if, you really, I, it's, it shows that at least three people in the room are actually listening, which is great. You know, every question has been fantastic. So the own resources, you know, MG... O, O, that, that first O, own resources. Research shows that teachers find this is the hardest part of TBLT to understand and to implement. Teachers always feel like they have to present the grammar first. Otherwise, how can the learners use the language? I've got to teach the language first. Otherwise, how will they use it? And yet, in study after study, when, when teachers step back, it's amazing how much the learners can actually do when the teacher gives them some agency. 
Now, I want to give you some examples to make this practical. Remember the happiness is poem? Remember that? Meaningful? Gap? Well, we've got to... Yeah, you know, and the, now, where's the own resource? And coming back to your question, well, the own resource is what makes me happy? What makes me happy? Playing my guitar at midnight. Great. That's my own resource. Now, if I don't know the word for guitar, I check with my friend, hey, what's the word for guitar? Or, or, what's it? or I look at a dictionary, or I check with, um, you know, I check on, on my, okay, great. Those are my resources. Me, and this is the slides I didn't show you, me asking for help is getting my own resources. Right? Me just kind of finding ways to express that. The kids who were reading the story about the, the visit to the museum, and they had to come up with the questions. They're using their own resources to, to choose. Well, what should we ask about? Why are museums dark? But then they don't know how to ask the question. So they've got to think, what's the grammar? So they check with each other, or they ask the teacher. If you ask the teacher, teacher, how do I say this? And the teacher says, well, why are museums dark? Okay, own resources. Because I have had to find the resource to express the meaning that I have got in my head. I start with the meaning, and I find the resource. And finally, in the third one we did there, the survey. Remember the survey? Get together in groups, and, and then you know, you've got to ask these questions. You've got to, in your groups, you've got to decide what your questions are, and then ask the questions. So coming up with the questions about, do both your parents work? Do you live in a nuclear family? How much time do you spend doing housework? To construct those questions, Learners have to kind of check with the teacher, check with each other, check with the dictionary. So that's fine. This, this, the, profound, the profound difference is that the, the search for grammar is coming from the learner and it's not predetermined by the teacher. Right? And this is the secret of TBLT that the task itself pushes the learners to find the language that they need. And so those are, in each of those examples, learners are using their own resources, own being asking the teacher, asking a friend, looking at the... So that um, when, when it comes to the learner's role, the learner can be guided by the teacher, but not by you know, the resource. So the, the learner cannot be guided uh, by using the resource because the risk comes from the learner themselves. Yes, thank you. Not quite, but... <laughs> you want to elaborate more? <laughs> thank you. Do you want to... Yes, um, I'm very grateful for the study of today presented to us. From what I've learned that we take back home, he gave us 10 options about a qualitative research. That has been my interest of study because I've done, gone a long way with quantitative analysis. So now, but I have a small doubt because I don't really understand about these diary studies. So I just need a brief overall about diary studies of a qualitative research. Diary studies? Yes. Di diary studies. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Diary studies, thank you. Diary studies were a kind of a big a big thing in the 1980s and 1990s. It's where a teacher simply, or, or a learner, I mean, a learner keeps a diary of their experience of learning. So it's literally, you know, we keep a diary. Anybody keep a diary? Yeah, okay. But, you know, so learners just keep a learning diary or the teacher keeps a teaching diary. What did I do today? And it's just a very free-flowing um, expression of their, of their teaching life day by day. And they write the diary over a period of time. And then that, that diary becomes the raw data. 
So then they look at the diary and they do a thematic analysis, right? So what are the themes in my diary over six months? And the, so the, the, the diary, raw data. The analysis is picking out the themes. Okay, that's good though. Because there are situations like I used to observe in the classroom, like about the diary, some students used to have where they, they take down some notes when the teacher is teaching. Is that like what I can consider a diary though? What do you mean? Sorry, so what? To, like the diary, right? Some students usually have their diary books in class. They take down some details of the teacher's lesson. Because, you know, qualitative analysis is something you need to be specific, giving the right information. So I've never learned about this. So I wish I would try to learn it. Because as a PhD student, you must be diversified to have knowledge about many things, because you will train others too. So thank you very much for this opportunity for me to learn today. Yeah, yeah. You've got to have a pretty committed student who's willing to write a learning diary. And they're also willing to share it with you. But it's a really interesting, you know, rich source of data if they are willing to write about their experience of learning in the classroom. Some of the most famous studies in the 1980s in applied linguistics were based on diary studies. So one of um, Schmidt, um, the famous noticing hypothesis uh, guy from Hawaii, you know, he based his one of his most cited articles on the diary study of an Argentinian learner of English and his experience of learning English, so yeah. But it was an, it, typically it's adults writing their learning diaries. It's much harder to get kids to do that. So thank you very much for all the questions and for the answer from our professor as well. I hope that you gain a lot of insight from this session and thank you very much for your fruitful information, invaluable suggestion on task-based learning. And we hope that well, we can, in, their, in, in our community, we can apply task-based learning into our classroom and get our students to think and work by, on themse by themselves and then learn the language by themselves too. Thank you very much, and please join me in giving a big round of applause to thank our professor one more time.